What's going on everyone? Welcome to today's video. I'm so excited for this one because it's a video I've wanted to make for a really long time. Like many of you out there, I appreciate a good challenge in my games from time to time. And when the time is right, I like to jump in and play something that's really difficult to get that rewarding sense of accomplishment that comes with overcoming some really tough challenges in games. And so with that, I wanted to make a list of the top 10 most challenging JRPGs I have ever played. Some of these were designed to be really challenging and some just feature more complex mechanics that require you to think and strategize to progress. Either way, I enjoy my time with many of these games and maybe you will too. Before we get started, hit the like button if you enjoy the video and subscribe if you're new here. So with all that out of the way, let's jump right into the games. I'm going to kick things off with SMT5 Vengeance because it is the most fresh in my mind having just played it for review. Be sure to check out my review on the channel if you haven't by the way. This right here is one of the most challenging modern turn-based JRPGs. This is a game that is designed to be pretty brutal and definitely tested my patience from time to time. But this game is so much fun and the mechanics are so well refined that it kept me coming back over and over. The combat system in SMT5 is a factor in its difficulty, of course. It's turn-based and uses that press turn system, which means exploiting enemy weaknesses can definitely give you the upper hand with extra turns, but making mistakes or having your weaknesses exploited by enemies can be severely punishing. This system requires you to carefully plan your actions in battle and pre-plan your party prior to exploration and boss fights. Everything in SMT5 requires you to think carefully and approach each challenge with a strategy. Building an effective team requires thought and preparation, making the game even more challenging, but also super, super rewarding when you do get it right. This all really helps me resonate with the different demons and connect with all the game's mechanics. Boss fights in the game are also particularly tough. They often have unique mechanics and super powerful attacks that require you to come up with specific strategies to defeat them. It's pretty rare on higher difficulties to come away with victory on the first try. At least that was the case for me. You can't just rely on brute force. You need to think super carefully about how to approach each boss. Even exploring the game's dungeons and overworld areas can be quite challenging. There are tough enemies everywhere, so you always need to be on your guard and really just ready for any difficult encounter that may come your way. Overall, these elements combine to create a game that constantly tests your strategic thinking, resource management, and battle skills, making Shin Megami Tensei 5 a truly challenging experience. Next up, I have Tactics Ogre. This might be my favorite tactics game of all time. My favorite thing about the game is probably also what I find makes it so challenging, which honestly makes for a great JRPG in my opinion and that's the class and leveling system. It adds this extra layer of complexity on top of the already challenging moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Characters can be developed in various ways and making suboptimal choices in class progression or skill allocation can have long-term consequences. You'll need to understand the synergies between different classes and abilities to create an effective and balanced team. Additionally, the game has a revamped leveling system where classes level up rather than individual characters which can present challenges in managing and optimizing your roster. Permadeath is another significant factor contributing to the game's difficulty. Many people like to have this option to turn it on or off, but I think this game specifically does a particularly good job of designing the game and its structure around this mechanic and forces you to treat every move with careful planning and strategy to avoid losing your favorite characters. If a character falls in battle and is not revived within a few turns, they are permanently lost. This just adds a layer of tension and high stakes to every encounter as losing a key character can be a major setback. On top of all this, the game features a branching narrative with multiple paths and endings. The decisions you make can lead to different challenges and battles, making each playthrough unique. The story-driven nature of the game encourages you to make tough choices, sometimes leading to more difficult scenarios depending on the path chosen. All of these elements combine to create a demanding, but rewarding tactical JRPG experience that requires careful planning, adaptability, and super strategic thinking. I love Tactics Ogre. Moving on, next up, I have Octopath Traveler 2. I don't know which game was more challenging, the first or the second game, but I feel like the design of Octopath Traveler 2 is what presents the challenge in some cases, whereas I felt that the first Octopath game was challenging in a way that just required a bit of grinding, 
to get to levels in line with more challenging boss fights. The game is challenging in a few different ways. The characters in Octopath Traveler 2 each have distinct job classes with unique abilities, and creating an effective party means understanding how these abilities work together. Balancing the roles and synergies of your team adds a layer of complexity as you need to make sure your party is well-rounded and prepared for different scenarios. I feel like the boss battles and how they're designed are where Octopath 2 truly shines. Boss fights can be particularly demanding. Bosses often come with powerful attacks, multiple phases, and unique mechanics that require you to adapt your strategies on the fly. These encounters demand a deep understanding of the game's mechanics and effective use of each character's abilities. You often find yourself hitting walls that even if you're at the right level, can present challenges that force you to utilize each of the game's mechanics at a high level. I'll add another factor here that I don't think many people address, but it is something I felt was cumbersome at times. The game's eight different characters each have their own storyline, and managing progress across multiple narratives adds to the complexity of everything. You need to ensure that all the characters are adequately leveled and equipped for their respective storylines. On top of that, as someone who is deeply invested in the narrative, I had this added pressure to experience things in the correct order. I know there isn't really a right order to do them in, but at times I would try and plan out how I would advance the storyline, which is not something I've ever had to do in a JRPG before. This is a great game and the challenge is incredibly rewarding and that's why this was actually my game of the year last year. Octopath Traveler 2, while difficult, is super, super rewarding and worth every minute. Bat and Kaitos, one plus two, and I'm putting the remasters on here, are next up on the list, and are games that I had never finished until the remasters came out. I believe I had these games in my backlog video earlier this year, so knocking these out was definitely fun. We all like to check some games off the dreaded backlog list. Anyway, these games presented a bit more challenge than I had anticipated for sure. Firstly, the combat system is card-based, which is quite different from traditional JRPGs, in Bat and Kaitos, you'll use a deck of cards to perform actions in battle. These include attacking, defending, and using items. This system requires strategic deck building and a bit of luck as you draw cards randomly during battles. Managing your deck to ensure you have the right balance of offensive, defensive, and healing cards can be super complex, and drawing the wrong cards at a crucial moment can make battles much, much more difficult. I actually didn't like this at first and was on the verge of putting the games down because as I experimented, at first it was pretty tough, but I tried different techniques and I actually found this incredibly rewarding as I worked more toward it. And when getting the right card at the right time happens in the middle of battle, it can feel super, super good. Trust me on that. The game also emphasizes elemental strengths and weaknesses. Each card can have elemental attributes and understanding how these all interact is key to dealing significant damage to enemies and minimizing the damage you take. This adds another layer of strategy to the game as you need to constantly adjust your deck and tactics based on the enemies you're facing. Exploration and progression in Bat and Kaitos can be challenging as well. Navigating the game's world and solving puzzles to advance the story requires careful attention to detail. Missing key items or not understanding a puzzle can lead to significant backtracking or getting completely stuck adding to the game's overall difficulty, but also my overall frustration. I think this was the aspect of the game I liked the least, if I'm being honest. I think using a guide would have helped with this, but I don't like to use guides personally on my first playthrough of games, just so I can see how much I can discover on my own, but there were definitely parts of this game that were particularly frustrating in that sense. All that aside though, I really enjoyed these games, and once everything clicked, it was absolutely incredible. These are games I'd recommend to any fan of the genre. They're not going to be for everyone, but some of you will definitely enjoy them. Scarlet Nexus is next up on the list, and this is one of my favorite action JRPGs and is a game that I think is super underrated. I did find this game challenging at times, and it may be because I am not the best at fast-paced action RPGs. I've gotten better over the years as I've gotten into them more lately, but Scarlet Nexus features a lot of unique mechanics that add to the overall challenge of the game. You will control one of two protagonists, each with their own unique abilities and weapons. The game requires mastering both melee attacks and psychokinetic powers, where you can hurl objects at enemies. I mean, coordinating these abilities effectively while dodging and countering enemy attacks adds a layer of complexity to the overall combat. The need to seamlessly switch between physical attacks and psychokinesis requires quick reflexes and a good understanding of how everything works. 
Nothing is really shoehorned in here or just there to be there. The game requires you to invest your time in mastering these mechanics to progress through the game. The game also incorporates a mechanic called the brain drive and brain field. The brain drive is a temporary state that boosts your abilities, but managing when to activate it for maximum effect adds strategy to the overall combat, especially in boss fights. The brain field is a more powerful but risky mode that enhances your psychokinetic abilities dramatically but can be dangerous if not managed correctly, as it has a limited duration and can cause damage to the player if overused. These mechanics are unique in a sense because I find that a lot of action games will use these as like kind of an overpowered mode to like get over the hump in difficult fights, whereas Scarlet Nexus uses these as a kind of trade-off where if they're not used correctly, they can actually be a detriment to the player. In summary, Scarlet Nexus, while not the most challenging game on the list, can be challenging due to its fast paced and complex combat system and diverse enemy types. These elements combine to create a game that requires quick reflexes and careful planning, making it a rewarding yet somewhat demanding experience. Next up, I have The Last Remnant. This is one that was actually on my most disappointing JRPGs list. Not that I hated the game completely, but I felt the difficulty at times was unfair and the overall moment to moment gameplay couldn't make up for the frustration I felt playing it. I do know some people who really love this game though, and it's on this list because I do think that there are definitely some fans of JRPGs out there that would really, really enjoy The Last Remnant. The game features a turn-based combat system that differs significantly from traditional JRPGs. Instead of controlling individual characters, you control unions, which are groups of characters. Each union can have its own formation and different formations provide very different advantages. Managing these unions, choosing the right formations, and understanding how to best use your units is a complex process that to me felt more like a chore, but to some could really be a mechanic that hooks you in. Adding to that, there's this whole morale system of your unions and how it plays a significant role in battle outcomes. High morale can enhance your union's effectiveness, while low morale can severely hinder their performance. The mechanics and their depth aren't the only challenging aspect though as the overall difficulty of the game and its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay are there too. The game features a wide variety of enemies, each with their own strengths and weaknesses and attack patterns. Many enemies and bosses have unique mechanics that require specific strategies to defeat. Understanding these mechanics and adapting your tactics accordingly is essential for success and progression, and failing to do so can result in some very challenging battles. There's definitely a steep learning curve here. It can actually be quite rewarding to progress, I can see why people really enjoy their time with this game. It just wasn't one that resonated with me. Moving on, I have Code Vein. This is kind of an anime Souls-like experience with action-focused combat that's meant to be challenging, and it really is at times. First, the combat is demanding and precise. You have to time your attacks, dodges, and blocks perfectly because enemies hit hard and can quickly overwhelm you if you're not careful. Managing your stamina is crucial since every action, whether it's attacking or dodging, drains it. This will all sound familiar if you play a lot of Souls-like games, and as someone who does play a lot of Souls-like games, this is one of my favorites. Customization adds another layer of complexity. Code Vein allows for extensive character builds. While this is great for personalizing your playstyle, it also means you need to experiment to find the best build for different situations. Choosing the wrong setup can make battles much harder, but this is actually my favorite aspect of the game. Testing out different builds and finding what works best for you is a ton of fun in my opinion. Navigating the game's levels can also be challenging. The areas are intricate with lots of paths, shortcuts, and hidden places. It's easy to get lost or ambushed by enemies if you're not careful. Plus, the risk and reward system keeps you on your toes. When you die, you drop all your collected in-game currency and need to retrieve it again without dying. Really, to be honest, all the things that make Souls games difficult are present here, so if you are familiar with those games, then Code Vein will feel right at home for you. If you're not and want to try Souls-like, but you prefer the more JRPG or anime aesthetic, then Code Vein is the perfect fit for that. Give this one a go if you haven't yet. I really enjoyed my time with it. Next up, I have Resonance of Fate. This is a game that I think is very difficult, and I would say it is widely thought of as a very difficult JRPG. The game features a distinctive combat system that combines real-time and turn-based elements with a focus on gunplay. Unlike traditional JRPGs, it relies heavily on positioning, timing, and understanding the game's mechanics. Mastering these mechanics requires practice and a good grasp of how to maneuver and coordinate your characters effectively. 
Unfortunately, I felt that the controls were a difficult aspect of the game as well, and at times I felt like I was fighting the controls and the camera of the game just as much as the game itself, which to me can lead to a bit of frustration. It takes some time to get it all down, but once you do, it can feel pretty rewarding to overcome some of the challenges in this one. I will say another aspect of this game is the lack of a solid tutorial. You could say the game doesn't hold your hand and forces you to get the hang of things on your own, but I do think there's ways to do that indirectly that will help the player get used to the combat systems. But the game's tutorial just does not thoroughly explain all the nuances of the combat. And for me, I wasn't a huge fan. It kind of left me to discover many of the game's mechanics on my own. This steep learning curve can be frustrating initially as it takes time to understand and effectively learn everything this game has to offer. While the game is technically turn-based, the pressure of executing actions within a limited time frame adds a real time element to the strategy you need to make quick decisions and execute them precisely, which can be very challenging, especially during intense battles. I actually liked this and had quite a bit of fun with the combat. Overall, Resonance of Fate is difficult because it combines a unique and complex combat system with deep customization, positioning, and resource management. I mean, I could go on and on. There's so many aspects of the mechanics of this game that are complex just for the sake of being complex, it feels like. The challenging enemies and high difficulty curve require you to invest tons of time and effort into mastering everything this game has to offer. It can be rewarding if you put the time in, but if you're not interested, it can be very, very frustrating. Next up, I have Valkyria Chronicles. I actually really love these games, and I think the challenge is really well implemented, making for a great overall experience. The game features a hybrid combat system that blends turn-based strategy with real-time third-person shooting, this system requires you to plan your moves on a tactical map and then execute them in real time. Aiming and shooting accurately while managing movement points, balancing these two aspects can be super difficult at times, especially for those new to the system, but once you get the hang of it, it's so, so much fun. Valkyria Chronicles also features various unit types, each with its own strengths and weaknesses, Understanding the role of each unit, like scouts and lancers and engineers and snipers, is super intricate, and then deploying them effectively is absolutely essential. Using the wrong unit for a task can lead to some rough battles. Another challenging aspect are the game's diverse maps, featuring various terrains and environmental factors that can impact gameplay. Cover is crucial, and positioning units behind sandbags, buildings, or natural cover can mean the difference between life and death. Additionally, some maps have unique hazards such as landmines and destructible cover, which add another layer of difficulty to everything. Lastly, many missions have specific objectives such as capturing a base, escorting a unit, or surviving for a set number of turns. Some also come with time limits or other constraints that add pressure to the overall moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Failing to meet these objectives can result in mission failure, requiring you to start over and rethink your strategy. I actually like this because it keeps everything feeling really fresh. Overall, Valkyria Chronicles can be a very challenging but super, super really rewarding game. It is a ton of fun to play. It's remastered on Switch. Definitely play Valkyria Chronicles. Finally, last up on the list is Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. This is one of the hardest games I've ever played, and I actually really, really love it. It took me a few tries for it to click with me, but once I did, I was hooked. I picked this game up and started it maybe three or four times because I would keep getting frustrated and moving on to something different, but that last time I decided to power through it actually really solidified my love for the SMT series. A lot of the reasons SMT3 is difficult are the same for each entry in the series, including 5, which I talked about earlier in this video. Compared to some other SMT games though, Nocturne offers less guidance and more freedom, which can be daunting for new players, which I very much was when I picked up SMT3. This game expects you to experiment, learn from your mistakes, and figure out the best strategies on your own. This lack of hand-holding can make the game feel more difficult, but also more rewarding for those who persevere. Oddly enough, the game's atmosphere also contributes to its difficulty in my opinion. I know that's weird to say, but it does. The dark, apocalyptic world of Nocturne is filled with moral ambiguity and tough choices that affect the story and gameplay. The oppressive environment reinforces the game's challenging nature, making every decision feel weighty and significant. 
This is a pretty tough game. It is often considered more difficult than other SMT games. All these factors I went over here combined with the things that just generally make SMT games really tough come together to create a challenging but deeply rewarding experience for those who embrace its demanding gameplay. All right, everyone, that's it for me in this one. Those are my top 10 most challenging JRPGs I've ever played. I really enjoyed my time with most of them, and the vast majority of the games on this list are absolutely worth pushing through to complete. If you do, you'll feel that ultimate sense of accomplishment when it's all said and done. Let me know in the comments below what you felt were the most challenging JRPGs you've ever played. Have you ever played any of the games on this list? Do you think more challenging JRPGs are fun to play, or do they just frustrate you? I look forward to hearing what you all have to say in the comments, and until next time, I'm out.